evening and welcome. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Michelle Stempian, and I am the Education and Community Programs Manager at the Holland Museum. Tonight's program is in connection with the exhibition currently on view, Matthias Alton, Beyond the Oil Paintings. The exhibition celebrates the 150th anniversary of the birth of Matthias Alton, one of West Michigan's most recognized artists. With a display of Alton's watercolors and sketches from the Grand Valley State University Art Gallery Collection. If you have not yet seen the exhibition, please come and see us and this wonderful exhibition, which is open through July 25th. We are grateful to have collaborated with GVSU for this exhibition and for the continued support from the Michigan Council of Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts. The museum's current hours are Monday, Friday, and Saturday from 10 to 5. In addition to the exhibits, we have unique items in the gift shop. And remember that memberships make great gifts all year long. We are always open the second Monday of the month in the evening from 4 to 7 for free. We continue to offer these programs at no cost so we can be accessible as possible to the community. However, if you enjoy the programs and have the capacity, please consider a donation to the Holland Museum. Tonight's program is being recorded and will be available in a few days on the Holland Museum YouTube page to watch again and share with friends. We ask that you stay on mute throughout the presentation um, at the end of the presentation, there will be time for a Q&A, and you can participate in the discussion by sending any questions you may have through the chat function. In a day or two, we will also send a program evaluation from the museum by email. Please complete it and be sure to let us know any topics that would be of interest to you for future programs. We appreciate your feedback as we continue to work to engage our audience. So on to tonight's program. I am delighted to introduce Royce Deans, an artist and art educator who grew up in, West, in the western suburbs of Chicago and graduated from the American Academy of Art. Royce now calls Traverse City home, where he has been working and teaching art for over 30 years. His art has taken him all around Europe and to Israel to exhibit his work and to give workshops. During his travels, he has spent extensive time in the Netherlands. We are excited that he is able to be with us this evening and is actually in the Focus Gallery at the Holland Museum to talk with us in depth about Matthias Alton's drawings from an artist's point of view. We really appreciate him being here, so please join me in welcoming Royce Deans. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Royce will share his. No, I don't, I don't do that. Sure. There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is, as Michelle said, Royce Deans, and I am in the Focus Gallery today. Um, I will share my screen in a minute and show you a presentation that I've put together. But first of all, I want to thank Michelle and the uh, Holland Museum for this opportunity to speak here tonight. Um, I just want to say, really, uh, considering the topic of my uh, talk tonight, which is like, uh, understanding uh, the artist's mind. I would uh, like to just say how fortunate we are uh, to have this exhibition of these drawings by Matthias Alton to enjoy, um, as Michelle said, as we celebrate his the birth, uh, the 150th anniversary of his birth. Um, as part of that celebration, there's been a couple of his, exhibitions of his paintings. Uh, early in 2020, there was a, a exhibition in Traverse City at the Dennis Museum, and most recently, uh, a large showing of his work at the, uh, the Graham in, in Grand Rapids, the Grand Rapids Museum of Art. His impressionistic paintings that were often painted en plein air, or on location, if you will, um, were from many of his travels around, all around the U.S. and Europe. Uh, in them, we see uh, the beauty and we're struck with the, uh, the different moods and fantastic places, colors, stories, all of which help us to begin to understand his object. The, uh, we, we begin to understand his subjects as we observe them. When we think about what we can actually learn about an artist, or in this case, Matthias Alton, 
when we see the paintings, there's a few things that we see right off the bat. One of them is how he handled paint, how he you know, moved his paint from his brush to the canvas. It's, it's quite wonderful to see this in person. In fact, anytime we can see art in person, it's great to see the actual work. We can be amazed by the, the creativity that it took to create these pieces of art. And when we have the opportunity to see a self-portrait, we can actually learn what the artist looked like. Um, no matter what or who the artist is, when we see their work in, in art books or museums or galleries, um, we still might, and I'm talking about paintings here, we still, still might not get quite a idea of what's in the artist's mind um, because, um, well, we might have to look a little bit deeper. Often by the time a painting is finished, what we have to look at is an edited down version of all of the possibilities that the artist considered as uh, he or she was uh, considering what he was gonna include in uh, this new work of art. I think we are all fascinated by the creative mind. That probably goes without saying. I know I am fascinated by it and there's creative minds. Uh, there have been since the beginning of time and in all different professions and um, it's these creative minds that belong to inventors that actually made all of the uh, modern conveniences that we enjoy today. And as, but as, as we think about artists, uh, that demographic, we, we kind of all typically fall into what everybody calls that, where they're creative types. And so I think that makes us interested in what artists are thinking. And as we think about their work, sometimes it's very complicated and it's, it's fascinating to kind of want to get inside the mind of the artist. If we really wanted to see what was inside uh, Matthias Alton's mind, we would have to uh, have been able to sit down with him and interview him and ask him. And that way we could find out what he was thinking. But since that's quite impossible, we'll have to try something different. Fortunately, by studying his drawings, we can understand how he is thinking about his subject in his compositions. By looking at his drawings uh, in this exhibition, we can witness the, the progression of the creative process. And to observe this progression is to get glimpses into the artist's mind, for sure. In the museum, we see eight drawings by Alton. Tonight, I wanna look at a few of them and see just what we can learn. Okay, but before I get into that, let's go back to a couple basics of art, shall we? What is a drawing? Since this is all drawings in this show, a drawing is generally thought of as a series of marks using a tool such as a, as a pencil or graphite, char charcoal, ink, even sometimes paint, uh, made by an artist on either pan uh, paper, canvas, wood, plaster, any other, any number of uh, grounds or substrates. Uh, some in the art world actually consider any work done on paper a drawing. I personally don't subscribe to that completely, uh, to that notion, except when we talk about sketches. So let's ask what then is a sketch? A sketch is a special kind of drawing. It might be a, a quick impression or a visual recording of an idea or a movement or a moment that the artist was experiencing. A check. A sketch can often uh, be a drawing where concepts of composition are developed and refined. Uh, drawings and sketches are very much at the center of the creative process for probably most artists. Quite often, sketches are never intended to, see, to be seen by anybody except the artist or the one that created them. Uh, and for that reason, many of them might not survive to be seen anywhere since the artist might actually discard them uh, because they feel like there's not much value to them once the, the painting or the project is finished. Um, it's funny because the, in the uh, exhibition, there's two watercolors, uh, one of which is considered a, a sketch, I think. And, um, so we'll see a painting sometimes and we'll say, well, that's a painting, it's beautiful. And we might wonder why that's considered a sketch as well. 
And if it's not the final version, if it's an in-between step and might not completely say everything that the artist wanted to say about it, um, the artist would consider that a sketch or a color study. So when we understand this about this uh, about sketches, it uh, doesn't matter whether or not they're in a sketchbook or not, when we see them, we start to understand that perhaps a sketch is the most intimate look into that we have into how an artist thinks. As we consider what we are looking at when we see an artist drawing, it's good to keep in mind that um, it's the most direct connection between what he or she sees with their eyes and the idea that's formed and the marks that are made on the piece of paper. In a finished painting uh, that is typically painted with a brush, uh, we have an actual cushion between the artist and the canvas in the form of flexible br bristles at the end of the brush. And so in some ways, I think that this is a much less direct connection to the artist's brain and what we finally see as a final piece of art. And so in that way, a painting, you could be considered as a little less intimate than um, that direct response that we have with a pencil that uses a, ri or a, ri a rigid tool. So as we consider this artist process and the, what a, a piece of art goes through to get to its finished state, we ask, what is the function of a drawing? Well, very often art is a, is a general concept, is a re, often a reflection uh, or a commentary on the world and society. Uh, and so regardless if the piece of art is representational or not, or if it's abstract or not, it doesn't really matter. It makes uh, artists at the very last, least observationalists. I feel like as an artist, perhaps the most important part of my job description is to look and to see. So the first thing a, a drawing does for us is to uh, expand what we see. I tell my students, the more you look, the more you see. Whenever I say that, I get a laugh um, because it does seem rather kind of simple and silly to say it, but it is in fact true. When we draw, we must look more intently than we would if we weren't drawing. Or if we do look, a, well, I, I guess I could say we do look more intently because in order to draw anything, we have to look at it more directly, more deeply, so that we can understand the properties of that object. For example, is it hard? Is the surface hard or soft, shiny or dull? Is it a light color or a dark color? We also observe how the object relates to the things around it. The other thing that drawings do that I want to mention is that they are really the best tool that an artist has to plan out a work to uh, in the finer details for our, something like a painting, what he or she wants to include. When we think of the parts of the creative process, a drawing then is often a, a intermediate step or a part of a series of intermediate drawings that are steps in the process of completing a more involved piece of art, such as a painting. Then a drawing can be, of course, a piece of art unto itself. And it can actually end up being, uh, and many artists do this, take a drawing to their finished expression of their uh, idea. There is a great wisdom, I'm gonna share my screen now, uh, by, a, in a quote by the American artist, John Singer Sargent. He was a great painter that was famously known for his portraits, not the least of which was uh, Madame X. What uh, John Singer Sargent said is you can't do sketches enough. Sketch everything and keep your curiosity fresh. We know Sargent for his lush paintings with uh, rich brushwork that seems so free and effortless. So we might not think of him as a sketcher as it was. Um, you know, like it might seem he was above that, but it's simply not the case in it as, as artists, it should never be the case that we feel like we're above sketching. And so keeping your 
curiosity fresh is an interesting concept that I think is so important. Um, the opposite, of course, would be to create boring paintings. Sargent knew that while you look more intently while you draw, you see more. That's fascinating, and I think it's endlessly so. So now let's look at this first drawing that I've chosen to look at and talk about here of Matthias Alton. Ah, looking at this drawing, we see a sheet of paper with several figures sketched on it. And here he is obviously trying to figure out what these figures are going to look like and what they will be doing. There are uh, a bunch of uh, female forms. Something we know about Alden, uh, Alton is that he was accomplished at painting the human figure and drawing. We see it in his work. They play a, a huge part in most of his paintings. When he went to Paris in 1899 to study painting with the help of a couple of wealthy patrons from Grand Rapids, he excelled at drawing the figure. In fact, he won the Grand Prix or first prize at the Academy for his figure drawing. When he returned to Grand Rapids, he established a, a figure drawing studio and hired models and had many students. So with this experience and access to, to models, uh, there's no doubt that he hired models to, to create these drawings, that he could uh, actually have something to observe uh, while he was figuring out what these figures would be doing. Even though he was an expert and very familiar with the anatomy and uh, proportions of the human body, he knew all too well the importance of drawing directly from the model. He knew uh, that the more you look, the more you see, and thus the more you know. And while artists generally have really great imaginations, there are some things that we just can't leave to chance. When, especially when drawing the human figure, um, especially, even more especially, uh, as it approaches something of realistic representation, uh, we need to be accurate in that everyone, including those that have never taken an, 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 an anatomy or figure drawing class, uh, will be able to recognize when there's something wrong with the, the shape or the proportion of the figure, uh, they will recognize it. They might not know how to tell you how to fix it, but they will recognize it and tell you about it. So it's important to realize that uh, Alton was probably, more than likely, working directly from the model here. And I think that's a, a really important thing to uh, consider. Doing gestural studies like we see here and anatomical ones are very common for artists to do. Here I have a drawing by Michelangelo. It's a study, uh, an anatomical study for Libyan civil, a section of the Sistine Chapel. We see that he paid a lot of attention to the musculature and in the back and the arms and the shoulders. In this drawing, we also see some very specific parts of the figure that are really key to making this painting a success. When we look at this hand that he drew here that's holding up this huge book, we can see that he had questions about that and he, he did another study here. I like to think that he possibly used his own hand uh, to, to draw that one, which would have been possible. Uh, as we look a little bit further, as we look at the painting, we can see the, the connection between the tension on this hand and in this toe on, on the left foot of this figure. And so this became really important, obviously so, as he has three different sketches of it in, in there. So this is, I, get, I show this as a common practice. Another thing is we look at this drawing by Michelangelo, we see that the drawings are just kind of placed where he could fit them on the page because it's not a composition that he was going to show to anybody, it was his study. And we see that very much in the same way as we, when we look at this drawing by Alton. Henry Matisse said, drawing is putting a line around an idea. I really like this statement because we can't always control where or when ideas come to us. And so if all we have is a napkin to draw on, that is just what we'll use. So. By drawing the idea, we actually do put a line or a series of lines around it. These next drawings uh, 
as long as we're looking at drawings. I have some drawings here by Paul Cezanne. They're not on a napkin, but we get the idea that the, this concept came to him and he just grabbed the first convenient sheet of paper and scratched them down. Here on the right, we see these two figures that are drawn on what looks like could be a shopping list. I'm pretty sure it's not, but it looks like it could. We could tell that he was, he was curious about this because the next drawings that are available are, are of that same figure. And you can see him searching out what that figure actually looks like. We'll come back to what uh, Cezanne is working on here a little bit later. But right now I wanna show you a couple uh, drawings of how I typically start out one of my uh, pieces of work. Cur my current body of work focuses on trees as the main character. So like Alton, those figures and how he went to the model to draw, I feel like I need to do my initial drawings while looking at the actual subject. And so I will go out into nature and find the, the tree that I wanna work with and make the drawing. I start with a gestural drawing like we see here on the left. And, and I consider the, the contours of the tree as well as the surrounding landscape and how they all interact. And then eventually I begin to refine that drawing and uh, look at the texture and the value not, and of course, not forgetting what's beyond the tree and the shapes that, that they have that come into play. All right. Um, once an idea has been drawn or it has a line put around it, like our friend Matisse said, uh, I start to think about my next move. And so these words by David Hockney, a British artist who is still alive actually, seem awfully important. Drawing is rather like playing chess. Your mind races ahead of the moves that you eventually make. When we have a series of drawings as we have in this exhibition, we can start to see these moves happening. Uh, so let's look at a few more of Alton's drawings and see if we can tell his mind and what, what he was looking at and how he was looking ahead, probably a little further ahead actually. So then remember these first studies that were just him uh, trying to figure things out. Let's look at the next one. Here we have a little bit more refined drawing of a winged female. It's a rather simple drawing, but he's actually given us a whole lot more to understand here. First of all, he's, he's decided on a pose that appears this, this woman is uh, gazing upwards, maybe even heavenward that feels even more so that way since she, he's uh, given us a halo here. He's also, we don't have just a floating figure on the page. She's obviously standing on something because there's a group of babies down here at the bottom. So they must be sitting on something. Although when we look a little bit closer, we see that some of those babies are playing uh, musical instruments. And uh, so I don't know, maybe they're ch cherubs. That could be, but as we see these sort of things, already in this simple drawing, we're starting to be able to attach some sort of narrative to it. And it becomes much more involved and important than maybe just those first sketches. I want you to look closely at the, at the uh, torso of this figure. We can see that uh, Alton was like rearranging his marks here. Uh, one thing that's really lovely about working in graphite is it's a very malleable medium and we can make changes. And so he was making several changes here. In fact, if you look carefully, you can see where there is a cherub that was placed here that he removed for compositional pur purposes, I'm sure. So they didn't have these two on either side of the figure, but I think it works really well. One thing that I wanna point out before we move to the next uh, slide is that I want you to pay attention to this diagonal line here, which kind of looks like just a stray mark in this drawing, but I think that you will uh, find that it's something uh, more than that as we look at the next one. So let's move on. Uh, in the next drawing, we have a much better understanding of what these drawings were for. Uh, it's pretty obvious that he was designing a mural of some sort. Uh, we don't know if this mural was ever painted or not, but for our discussion this evening, that's not really so important. So what do we see here? 
And what is Alton thinking now? Well, we see as we recognize this diagonal line that I was mentioning, that that is uh, a boundary or a border of some kind. It represents something of the limits that he had to work with. Uh, it probably would uh, represent an archway or a pediment or something in a large building that this, this mural would be painted in. We see several female figures that are be, being arranged in some sort of uh, Korea did columns seen a lot in Greek, uh, classical Greek architecture. Koreadids are columns that are carved with female forms in them. Uh, we can tell still that nothing's quite settled in his concept in this drawing. There's lots of things going on, nothing's quite solid. But especially when we look at this inset drawing, we can see he's placed a tree here. Obviously he's going to have lots of uh, vertical uh, marks in this composition, and he's considering that maybe they won't all be these female figures, they might be trees. Another thing that we see here is uh, this version, the large version, there's two philosophers or orators here standing at this pulpit. And it's interestingly, they're looking at these, at these women or this scene that's happening there. His other idea has a whole group of uh, philosophers, but they were all turned away from the scene, kind of having a conversation with themselves. So I think this is uh, interesting to see his considerations as he is working this out. All right, in the next frame, we see that the philosophers are all gone and they've been replaced by shrubbery. But other things are being more refined. He's uh, edited out a couple of the, the female forms. We see wings starting to develop here in classical sort of mural form. Uh, we see these, these banners above their heads, which would probably contain their names or the particular virtue that they represent. Our little pulpit is still here that will probably be used for some other graphical means. And also there's appeared some sort of a battle or a hunt scene happening in uh, the background. And so uh, while everything's just uh, uh, still a little bit up in the air, we can see that uh, ideas are bubbling to the surface and he's starting to like hone in on something here. So as I said, I wanted to go back to Cezanne. Let's look and see what he's been working on. From his first sketchy scribbles, he's taken these figures, you'll recognize these two guys, and added a few more friends and put them, in, put them in a landscape outside and given us some color to deal with. So we understand a whole lot more than we did from the, the little sketches. On this drawing on the right, we can see that he has the same figures that are in this drawing, but he's just altered them slightly. Uh, this guy here on the, on the left, he's turned him around and he's not facing us anymore. And he's given us a new guy new character over here that's kind of squatting down, facing away from the rest of the group, but looking back in. I think another really wonderful sort of compositional choice. Let's look at the final painting. Here's the final piece created by Cezanne. And you can see that because of all of the work that he did ahead of time, working out what these figures are all gonna be, he could stay pretty true to that concept and we see that these figures look very much a lot like the last frame. Oh, right. As long as we're talking about other artists and, and drawing, uh, let's see how um, somebody else uh, did this. You'll recognize this painting as uh, Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, probably one of the uh, most recognizable paintings in all of art history. Um, it's as fascinating actually as it is famous. Uh, I could probably easily fill another evening with just talking about this painting by itself, but we'll save that for another time. But let's look at a couple of drawings that Van Gogh did prior to making this painting. In this drawing, it was made in ink. And uh, it's a medium that Vincent used a lot. This drawing has very similar qualities to the oil painting. Uh, probably about as many similarities as an ink drawing could be to an oil painting. 
as we see a very similar treatment to his ink is to his brush strokes. We can see that Vincent was up on a hill looking down. In fact, he painted this painting while he was in the asylum in uh, San Romy de Provence. But for me, it looks like this particular drawing would look pretty much just as Vincent would see it as he was sitting there on the hillside. And we might even look at this and say, wow, the treatment of this is, this is the drawing for Starry Night. But there's something not quite right, I think you'll agree. And so let's look at another drawing that he did. And in this one, he's, we can, whoops, in this one, we can see that he's still on the hill overlooking San Romy, but he's given much more emphasis to this stand of cypress trees and put a really gestural move through the sky here that's, that's fascinating. It's not just the twinkling stars we saw before. In this drawing also, we notice that he's included color. So these very well could have been color notes for him before he started the painting. For us, it makes it a lot more interesting. All right. I wanna show you uh, the next stage that I go to in my drawing as I, uh, after my gestural drawings, I uh, start adding what, I'm, what I call construction lines that help me to understand the proportion and rhythm of trees and how they relate to nature. And so this becomes a schematic and a working drawing for me that as I, as I move to working on the canvas. Here I'm working on this painting. I typically start in the background and work towards uh, the main subject. And here is a picture of uh, near, the nearly finished painting. And you can see that I keep the drawing nearby uh, by the way that I work, I'm, I'm pretty much always making adjustments in my painting as I go along, especially as I enlarge it from the small drawing to a large canvas. And so there are adjustments to be made, but at the same time, I need to be reminded of my initial impression and uh, the thoughts that I had here with these drawings. All right. Let's return to our friend Matthias Alton, shall we? Here's another drawing. Again, he's taken it a little bit further. Uh, this is the first time we see that there's a title to this mural, The Spirit of Time. Uh, and he's got quite an understandable uh, concept going here. Uh, we can see from looking at the drawings before that he had a path that he's following. And I get the impression that it's probably the method that he used over and over again, regardless if he was uh, working on a, a painting or a mural. Here are some of the things we notice that the, the, the female figures are, are much more uh, detailed and involved. Uh, their wings have kind of become this stylized banner that runs across the top of the piece. And this battle or hunt scene is continuing to grow and in interest and uh, dynamic. The shrubbery has uh, evolved into some uh, roses, I guess it looks like. But this pulpit box still remains. Okay, again, we don't know if this mural was ever uh, installed or painted or completed, but after looking at these studies, uh, these drawings, uh, I would sure love the opportunity to see it if it, if it does exist. I would like to uh, look really quickly at two finished murals by uh, Alton that some of you may have seen if you saw the show in at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. I just wanna show these so that you can see how he handled uh, his mural paintings and how he included groups of figures to help push the narr narrative along uh, in these two, we see the sources of wealth and the sources of uh, the uses of wealth. And so the narrative that goes along with this is pushed along by the figures. And in this one, we see this angel character up here at the top of the page, the uh, top of the mural that has this text in it. And I just will presume that when we look at this, that this box would, would, would have been reserved for that kind of uh, text. Okay, um, we've been um, 
let's see, excuse me. Uh, we've been talking about these drawings that were more than likely done for uh, the purpose of planning out a mural. Uh, Alton was actually more well known for his plein air landscape paintings. And there are two of them here in the show that just happened to be watercolors while well, he worked a lot in oil. Uh, it's interesting because the, the two drawings, uh, the paintings that we're gonna see uh, are painted on the same, or opposite sides of the same piece of paper. That's not an uncommon practice. As I mentioned before, as artists, if we need, if we wanna draw something and all we have is a napkin, we will grab that. And if we wanna do a painting, if all that's there is the backside of another painting, most artists have been known to, to do that. So anyway, this is what Alton said about working in nature. Working directly from nature lends strength and color to the work. Studio work is necessary for certain types of work, but never as interesting to me as working under the open sky. And I can uh, relate to that. I think it's, uh, there is something about seeing uh, your subject and being in the presence of it. So I want to look at this first painting that is actually the first painting you'll see when you come into the gallery. It's called The Foggy Day. It is a painting of the Park Church in Grand Rapids. Uh, the fountain is no longer uh, in place uh, in the park, but there is a, there's still a park there. Uh, and the church remains, the trees have become much more mature. Uh, but as we look at this painting, I think it's really fascinating being uh, an, an impressionist. Uh, we can understand quite well what he was seeing and feeling on this day. And so uh, I, I took the opportunity to stop by there yesterday. It was not a foggy day. It was a bright sunny day. But when we look back and forth, and they, they, we can see that the the building hasn't changed and those are the proportions of what we saw and as we look at his his uh, work it's exciting to see how he uh, expressed what he was looking at especially when we look at the atmosphere in this painting a foggy day but the painting that's on the back side of that watercolor was really what caught my attention it's called lake michigan dunes study I read uh, in looking some things up about uh, Alton that he had spent some time up north in Michigan around Leland. Actually, it's not too far from my studio in Cedar. Uh, I'm relatively, well, I'm very close to the Sleeping Bear National uh, Lakeshore and I spent a fair amount of time out there hiking around and drawing and painting. So when I saw this watercolor, I thought I was pretty sure that I knew where it was. So I was interested to see if I could find it myself and go to that place where Alton actually stood to make this study. And so I packed up my sketchbook and walked out there. And after snooping around a little bit, I found what I think is that place. Uh, I was interested looking at this drawing to find this dune that's here on the right side with all of this vegetation and trees uh, in the middle, which is very unique because there aren't a lot of uh, stands of big vegetation out there. But when I got to this place, I could see that this boggy area here, which is pretty marshy at times, would be a perfect place in this desert of the, uh, the dunes to uh, grow this vegetation. So it was really great to see that. And so once I figured out where I was, I started to draw and it was just pretty uh, exciting to be where what I thought was probably the same place. And once I got back to my studio, I compared my drawing to the place where we see this was. And I think that I'm pretty convinced that I'm, uh, I found the place where he was. And that's, as an artist, uh, that's really exciting to, to find a place that uh, somebody that you uh, respect uh, painted. So I, uh, I think that the, oh, I want to go back to this one thing for a second. 
this is this was the painting that he painted on the the back of again it was a study i get the feeling from this that he probably dashed this off re relatively quickly he was wanted to capture the moment and it may have been a study just for his own um, pleasure or maybe it would, would be something he was hoping would be a, a bigger piece but obviously these sort of drawings and studies are hugely important to to his work and to any artist's work. I have a, in conclusion here, I have a quote by Gustav Klimt. He said, great paintings don't happen by accident. First, you must have a clear artistic vision through drawing. Um, in conclusion here, as Klimt uh, says, we will have a, uh, a clearer vision through drawing. And in other words, the more we look, the more we see, and in turn, the more we know. And we can see more when we draw than when we just look around. Matthias Alton was an artist that understood this. His drawings in this exhibition are indeed a window into the artist's mind. It's, ex it's exciting to see the way his work uh, expanded through this process. Drawing has always been an important part of making art. And one of the fabulous things about drawing is that the, uh, the tools to make a drawing are just so simple, a pencil and a paper. It's available to everybody. I would encourage everyone to stop and draw something this weekend. It doesn't matter if you consider yourself an artist or not. You'll find that no matter how simple or complicated the thing you choose to draw is, that you will find out something new or something you didn't know about this object that you chose to draw. I think that's very exciting. And so, uh, again, I would like to uh, thank you. Th thank you for being here tonight. And uh, thank you, the museum, for this opportunity. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you so much, Royce. That was incredibly interesting. And I know I have learned a lot more about uh, Alton and, and his work and his drawings and where, where that comes from in the artist. Um, so if uh, we can have some time for some questions um, for Royce, if um, you have a question, if you could put it in the chat and then we will share it with him. Okay, um, there's a question. Um, did he leave behind any journals or written record of his approach? Hold on, I lost the rest of it. Or feelings about painting? Sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear the question. So can you ask okay. that again? I will ask again. Um, did he leave, did Alson leave behind any journals or written record of his approach or feelings about painting? Uh, I, I, I don't have an answer for that exactly. I don't. Uh, I, I think your next lecturer, Joel, will, will have a lot more light to shed on that. Yes, and I think you're right about that. Um, we do have another presentation in May, on May 13th, with Joel Zwart, who is the curator of exhibitions from Grand Valley State. So he may be able to answer that. I don't, what I know of Alton, I don't think he left behind extensive records, but I'm sure there's something. But yeah, um, I don't know any details about that. Um, we had another question about how many pieces of his work exist. Again, I don't know if you, Royce, you probably don't know that. I don't know that, but it's a lot. It's, yes. I mean, there's hundreds, there's, there's lots around. Yeah, he, he was a very prolific artist and he had a fairly long career. So um, most of his, there are a lot of works. Um, and another one is where are most of his works housed? Uh, I know Grand Valley State University has a, a really large, large collection of them. Um, I don't know if there's any more uh, exhibitions of, of that work planned in the future. The one at the Graham was pretty impressive. Uh, and I know there's lots in private collections, uh, particularly in Michigan. Yes, I, um, I would say that a lot of Michigan museums, especially here in West Michigan, have works by Alton in their collections. Um, Grand, Grand Rapids Art Museum, 
Uh, the Holland Museum actually has some Matthias Alton uh, paintings in our collection from his time in the Netherlands. Um, and uh, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts has some, I would think probably Muskegon also has I some. Think, so there are, there are I I, paintings I in a lot the, of places. Uh, the Toledo Museum of Art and the Art Institute in Chicago also. Yes, and I would be surprised if the Detroit Institute of Arts also has right. some. So there are lots of places where you can see his works. Um, and there was another question, are they on display at Grand Valley State? They do have a small gallery that shows some of his works all, pretty much all the time. So, oh, and somebody wrote that they have two here in Holland. So yes, um, I will mention, and actually I will put the link, I will find the link and put it in the chat. Um, Royce mentioned Grand Valley State University, which is where the works that we have from the museum are where they came from. Um, they also have an uh, online Alton portal, um, which has an incredible wealth of information about Alton, a timeline of his life, uh, articles written about him, information written by his family members. Um, as well as his catalog raisonné online, which a catalog raisonné is a complete record of an artist's body of work. And it is online at through Grand Valley State University. So I will, if there are other questions, we'll move to those, but I will um, find that link and, and share it. Where is the mural for which the sketches you discussed were made? We, we don't know that. We don't know. I was, I was talking with Joel Zwart about that and we don't know if the sketches ever turned into a mural. Uh, and if they did, there's no record of where it is or if it, if it did come to be, if, if it exists now. That's the sad thing about so many murals that awful things happen to buildings from being torn down to burned down or whatever, so. The, yeah. No, no. I, like I say, if I could see that one, I would love to, because I've I've looked so carefully at those drawings now. So. Yes. Um. And uh, a, a question that was sent in before the program, which um our director Ricky has mes mes mentioned in the chat, is that there was a question: is if his granddaughter is still alive, and his granddaughter Anita Gilio who um, donated the Netherlands paintings to the Holland Museum is currently alive and she's 97. So um, uh, somebody was asking about showing an Alton oil portrait that they are restoring. Um, I would have to make you a co-host to do that. <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> It's a it's a good friend of mine in Traverse City. Lately. Okay, let me see. Let me see. I can. Yeah. Yeah. If you can uh, um, spotlight Dan Obershaw for you, that'd be great. Okay. I am. I just made made him a co-host. Okay. Or you can just spotlight him. Okay. He's hi Dan. There he is. Okay. There it is. Tip it down a little bit, Dan, there we go. Wow. <laughs> How cool is that? That's very cool. Wow. A little extra, a little extra here. Bonus. Thanks, Dan, that's awesome. Thank you so much. <gasps> okay, um, any other final questions that anybody needs to put into the chat? This was a wonderful presentation. Thank you. We think so Thank too. Thank you, Chris. Yes. Okay. Well, if if no one has any other questions, um, I am just and I, I will wrap things up again. Thank you so much, Royce. What an incredible presentation on Matthias Alton. Please come down and see uh, the exhibition on display. Um, it will be here until July twenty fifth. And as I mentioned, this program was recorded and it will be available on the Holland Museum website in a couple of days. And so you can go to our website and find the link. So, oh, somebody said they love your trees. Thank you, Sherry. <laughs> <laughs> and grateful for your perspective as an artist. So it was really a, it was really a pleasure to dig into his work. Um, 
and and to make the, those observations. So thank you for the opportunity. Okay, great. Thank you again, everyone. Everyone have a good evening and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye, Michelle.